Ah, just before we actually begin, so uh, uh, Professor Time Thomas uh, lecture will be recorded and broadcast. So uh, those of you who are on Zoom, uh, if you do not want to show some uh, aspect of your uh, well uh, room and so on, please uh, feel free to turn off the video. Uh, okay, but otherwise, I think it's good to show your face. Of course. Uh, okay. Um, all right. I guess it's uh, about time, so shall we get started? Okay. So okay. So um, well, well, welcome everybody. And um, today and uh, later also actually uh, throughout the week, we are very happy to have uh, Professor Daniel Thomas from Boston College. Uh, he is visiting um, for, uh, for 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 the for the, uh, for the week. Okay. And uh, let me. I know that Typhoon has a lot of things to talk about today, but uh, let me just steal one minute from his time and introduce, uh, introduce him to all of you. Well, actually, probably I do not need to introduce him because, well, uh, he's a uh, uh, very, very, very well known uh, uh, in my design. Well, um, so I just Googled just to check, uh, uh, check his paper, which paper I should mention. Uh, uh, in the introduction, well, there are too many, so I, I, I let me not do it. Um, so, well, just one. So, for example, his uh, his paper on school choice in 2003, you know, everybody should have read it. If not, you should read it. Um, uh, had a Google style citation of 2000. Uh, okay, and uh, similarly for other, uh, other, uh, other papers of his. So, uh, parts uh, and um, so at the personal level, I'm really uh, half very happy and half a little bit nervous because actually he was on my committee when I was in grad school. And I would often go to Boston College to take his, his uh, classes, uh, class actually. So, um, well, uh, so I hope that, well, I, I, I enjoyed his class every time I attended it. So I hope that, if, I, I, I hope that uh, everyone uh, will enjoy uh, lectures uh, as much uh, as I did. Okay. And uh, well, uh, I promise not to steal too much time from Typhoon. So let's, uh, yeah, let's welcome Professor Typhoon Thomas and uh, uh, let's begin. The floor is yours, Professor. Well, thank you very much, uh, Puito. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I'm also very delighted to actually, you know, uh, present uh, uh, this particular framework, uh, which I now call uh, minimalist market design. So like in the last, uh, especially last 10, 15 years, it increasingly became more clear that the way I do market design is somewhat different than, you know, how others do it. And uh, uh, until now, I didn't put the name of it. Like uh, I wasn't really talking about what's the broader framework, which is you know bringing these applications, and uh, uh, so so now that's uh, that's what I'll do. And uh, the structure of these uh, lectures will be uh, as follows. Uh, uh, today we'll have lots of content. You know, I'll talk about school choice, kidney exchange, house allocation, but it will not be technical at all. Uh, so uh, 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 yet it will be very analytical, okay? And uh, what I'm trying to do is, I'm trying to explain today, I'm hoping to explain today, you know, how is it that I come up with research questions? And how is it that I structure these research questions in a way that I can actually convince policymakers to change whatever they are doing, if they are doing something wrong, right? And, uh, and, and basically, if I'm hoping to influence uh, policy, uh, you know, I cannot just, uh, you know, make lots of assumptions and come with, uh, you know, stories that is very natural to economists, but, uh, Perhaps non-economists might be sometimes offended. Sometimes you might think, you know, we are ivory tower researchers, right? So if you want to influence policy, uh, if that's one of the objectives, uh, that actually has an implication on the research question. Uh, and uh, so, so, but 
uh, let me actually start and you'll see where I'm going. I'll really uh, give you, you know, you know, why I introduced this notion, you know, why not, you know, do what Milgram is doing, Roth is doing. And the first answer is uh, the way they do design, you know, they were invited for a design, you know, an institution just breaks and they've, you know, called the famous guy, what do we do? The famous guy uses known theory and, uh, you know, supported with, uh, you know, simulations, experiments, you know, policymakers will never ask them to come up with new theory, right? Uh, because, you know, in some cases, the expert is called just to say fix, right? There's a big problem in the system. And policymakers, maybe they just want to show, you know what, we are taking this seriously. We brought the best guy, right? Uh, now, you know, I wanted to do the same things when I was young, uh, but I figured, you know, that will probably never happen, right? Uh, so then I figured out, okay, you know what? Uh, maybe I should do things uh, somewhat differently, right? Maybe I should make it clear that uh, I need to convince people that there is a need for change, which others didn't need, uh, right? Because, uh, you know, people where there is a you know, broken system, uh, they call for the experts in those cases. Right, so, so now I will talk about how this, you know, framework evolved through applications and uh, where we reached. And, uh, and in the uh, next three lectures, uh, it will be more like case studies uh, applying uh, this particular framework. And, uh, emphasizing different aspects sometimes. Uh, okay, so the broader framework, uh, I call it minimalist market design. Uh, I have a manuscript uh, about it uh, that I circulated a few months ago. And if you have seen the manuscript, uh, it reads as if this is a framework which is developed to influence policy. And it is. Like, uh, you know, if you don't know, I was a really bad student at college. Like uh, in my fifth semester, my GPA was like 1.6 out of four. Uh, so I was always this guy with very high standard deviation. Uh, so uh, never did anything I don't feel like doing. And then this really doesn't go well with, uh, you know, you know, most uh, settings, okay? But also one good thing about that is I didn't care about publishing as much as other people do. So my priority was never really publishing this stuff. Publishing is nice, right? And we work a lot for, for it, but uh, I'll give you a secret when I'm starting. If your main, if your first order objective is influencing policy, uh, and if you are following mainstream paradigms, thinking like mainstream economists, uh, you have a bit of a problem, right? Uh, so there is a bit of a disconnect sometimes, right? And if the main objective is publishing, you are not very likely to convince policymakers to change an institution because of the following. The problem, you'll solve a problem in a very able way, except it will not be their problem. It will be a completely different problem, right? And then you're unlikely to succeed to convince these guys that the problem that we are solving is actually their problem they got to care about, right? And there are various groups uh, like in sociology and, and in other fields who are a bit annoyed by actually uh, the, you know, some, our approaches, mainstream approaches, 
And you know, there's this literature called you know, performativity thesis. People claim that we make the real work kind of similar to our models and uh, literally changing the world in ways we shouldn't, right? Uh, and sometimes, and because we have the uh, benefit of formalism, uh, sometimes, most of the time, they don't even realize it, right? So anyways, so let me start with some of the uh, you know, main ideas. So let's consider an economic, political, or social institution that is deployed to fulfill a number of objectives. Like typically, you know, it has many components, each serving its own purposes and interacting uh, in each other in various ways. Like for instance, there might be one component like uh, dealing with property rights at a single institution, right? Now, if you wanna use this idea for multiple institutions, uh, then, the interfaces needs to work in a particular way. And uh, you guys have lots of expertise in this country, uh, like both in economics, uh, you know, computer science, uh, discrete math, right? So like the subsidies con conditional, you know, M convexity, they are kind of about, you know, how this particular interface between different components, uh, you know, should work if you want, a good working, you know, small component be expanded in a way to deal with, you know, uh, multiple institutions. And uh, so, so basically I would think of an institution like an organism basically, okay? Now let's suppose that the institution fails in some of its objectives. Uh, maybe some of its components are broken or maybe there's an issue with the interface between various uh, components. How can a design economist be helpful in addressing these failures? So what should we do? Okay. Let me first ask the following question. How would experts in other areas deal with these kind of situations? Like how would a surgeon address a similar failure on a human body? Uh, you know, you have something with your knee, you know, they'll not pull out, uh, pull your feet, right? Uh, typically not at least, uh, unless there's a sophisticated relation between the knee and, uh, you know, your two. Uh, what about the mechanic on a broken car, right? How would they do? Well, what they would do is these experts would first identify the root cause of the failure. And this is the most important you know, phrase, root cause. And it is what kind of differentiates what I'm doing from uh, most other people, okay? So they would first identify the root cause of the failure, whether it has to do with a component itself or an interface between various components, and they would directly address the failure, right? They would not deal with, uh, you know, mess with uh, unbroken parts of the uh, car or human body. A surgeon would remove disease tissue or organs, repair body systems, or replace disease organs with transplants. A mechanic would re repair or replace the warm part of the uh, uh, broken uh, part. So what I now call minimalist market design is a paradigm under which a design economist operates in a similar way, okay? And I'm associating, uh, you know, this, framework with market design, but I've been suggested that uh, these ideas might be useful also uh, in you know, other policy related fields, like public finance also. So in minimalist market design, I, uh, there are three main tasks. Uh, from the perspective of influencing policy, okay? So when I see a broken institution, for instance, and if I wanna change it, this is how I attack, okay? These are the main uh, tasks. First, 
I identified the mission of the institution. What is it that these guys are trying to do, right? Uh, what are the primary objectives of the policymakers, system operators, and other stakeholders? And the history of the institution is often very instructive. Actually, if you read, you know, the history of the institution, sometimes it's very straightforward. It will be very straightforward to us, you know, what they are trying to do. But then if you say, you know what, these guys are roughly trying to maximize this objective function and then let's do this, let's do this under equilibrium, uh, you know, conditions, uh, then uh, like, we might have issue communicating with people, uh, stakeholders. So that's the first task, identify the mission of the institution. The second task is determine whether the institution play satisfies these primary objectives or not. Now, if it doesn't, then there's potential for policy impact with a compelling alternative design. What's a compelling alternative design? To me, a compelling alternative design is the following. A compelling alternative design is a design which doesn't mess up with parts which are not broken, right? I found an issue. It doesn't mean that the entire system is broken, right? Like probably these people just didn't know how to deal with certain technical aspects or maybe certain conceptual aspects. Just fix whatever is broken and don't touch anything else. Okay? And this is also what we are used to, right? Actually at the intuitive level, like we always say, uh, you know, the closer the design is to the pure practice, the more likely you are to succeed. Like we have always told that, but what does it mean? Okay, so in my setting, it is a very precise meaning. You know, find the source of the issue and directly address it without touching anything else. Okay, so, so basically the third task is fixing these causes of the issues, by only interfering with the broken pieces, as if a surgeon is performing a minimally invasive procedure. Okay, so why does that help me? Well, it like by doing this, I'm showing policymakers that you know I'm not dismissing all your work, your history. I'm not coming up with these crazy ideas. You were this close to finding the perfect system, but there is this technical issue or conceptual issue. You just made the small mistake. You can fix it. This is, you know, what I'm designing is not my system. Actually, it's your system. It's what you wanted in the first place, right? And uh, when you don't touch with unbroken parts of the system, uh, you're a lot more likely to succeed uh, at this. I mean, uh, I have been, uh, you know, fairly fortunate with this approach. Uh, okay. Now, in some cases, uh, the discord between the mission of the institution and its practical implementation can be eliminated by a unique minimalist intervention. Okay. Then a solution is straightforward. Straightforward doesn't mean that it's easy to find. Uh, it's, it's typically not easy to find. But if it happens that there was a very clear error, like root cause, and you know how to fix it, and there is only one way to fix it, then a very compelling case can be made for an alternative design. Right. Okay. In lectures two and three, uh, we'll give examples of that uh, from Army's branching system and uh, affirmative action in, in India. In some cases, the primary objective of the stakeholders may not be compatible with each other. Right. Uh, and then, then it's a little bit more tricky. Right, we gotta explain to you, okay, look, it seems like you want A and you want B, 
but you cannot attain both of them. You either give up one or find some sort of an interim criteria, whatever that means, okay? Like an example of that would be the incompatibility between Pareto efficiency and non-justified envy in the context of school okay? So at that point, you, we might need to, I mean, these designs are harder, right? Uh, because then I need to actually interfere with the mission of the institution simply because uh, it's unattainable, right? But then, uh, you know, some parties might care more for one objective, other parties might care for other objective, uh, you know, convincing everybody might be more tricky in these settings, right? Okay. Finally, in some cases, there might be several minimalist interventions, which may, eliminate the discord between the objectives and the practical implementation. So now, I never had anybody told me the following in the field, like they have a problem, I fix it. Nobody really asked me, is this the only way to do it? Like it never happened, okay? Uh, however, I think we should actually do our best to be very open and clear about this. And, you know, basically give a, you know, relatively complete description of, you know, all possible minimalist, uh, you know, resolutions, uh, or at least something close. And uh, to illustrate the importance of this last step, even though, I mean, uh, I mean, this is a relatively sophisticated thing, a step that I'm doing, right? There was an issue we are fixing, but then I'm saying, you know what? We can do it in several ways. And the reason I care about this multiplicity is this multiplicity typically involves all kinds of distributional implications. Like I might include all kinds of systematic biases in the system in a way nobody ever realizes it, right? So if I'm an evil, if I'm the consultant for an evil policymaker, like this can be really bad, right? Uh, but then I can also use this methodology to unravel these kind of biases already in the, uh, in the existing system, even when the system is not broken. So basically, this last step is useful not only to change policies, uh, like to, to change institutions, it might also help you with analysis, you know, with, you know, unraveling, you know, certain biases, systematic biases in the systems. And this is becoming increasingly more important uh, in uh, today's world. Uh, Shanguli calls this notion inform neutrality in the context of uh, market design and ethics. And uh, basically this fourth step is really in line with uh, uh, his conceptual point and uh, the importance of this last point will be like very clear uh, in the last lecture, in lecture four. Okay. So today in lecture one, I'll present the philosophy of uh, this framework and its evolution through my integrated research and policy efforts from late 90s to mid 2000s uh, with a range of collaborators, most notably with uh, you know, Atla Abdukadroli, Yan Chen, Haluk Ergen, Barak Patak, uh, Al Roth, and Utku Inver. And uh, yeah, we will have a lot of stuff today. Uh, uh, so how can an aspiring design economist uh, can overcome various barriers to inform policy when she's an outsider? So how do I convince policymakers they should, I tell them like they are unaware that they have an issue in their system. Uh, and if they are aware, it's their system, like they design it. They answer to somebody, right? Uh, I come there, I told them, you know, 
this is broken. Uh, it's broken because of this, and you gotta fix it like this. Like nobody feels happy when I make these points. Like uh, nobody is, you know, excited. No policymakers ex excited at the beginning, at least, with these observations. Right? I'm the bearer of the bad news. How do I turn the tables? Okay. How does theoretical research in house allocation relate to this particular approach actually? Like uh, I'll start with house allocation. Or how did in my unsuccessful policy efforts in school choice in the context of Turkey led to the successful efforts in Boston public schools later on? And how did we convince uh, you know, kidney uh, transplant surgeons uh, to adopt an entirely different paradigm? Uh, okay. So one aspect of minimalist market design, which contributes to its success is actually the following. I'm literally trying to imitate the natural evolution of a real life institution, uh, but something went wrong. Maybe some, there was a technical challenge policymakers couldn't deal. So, but instinctively what I'm trying to do is like, or what I was trying to do when I was young was, okay, like this guy is messed up. But what they're trying to do makes perfect sense. It's just they have conceptual difficulties, right? These other fields, uh, they are not trained in formalism the way we are trained. Right? It's perfectly normal. Like even most economists wouldn't be able to make some of these points that we are making, right? Uh, so initially, uh, you know, I was trying to recreate what's going on, but I was doing this instinctive, like I didn't know at the time, I'm actually following a paradigm or what I'm doing suggests a paradigm. So school choice kidney exchange, it's not like I was following a paradigm, but rather developments in the context of school choice and kidney exchange led to this paradigm, which I started deliberately following in a very religious way, in the last maybe like 12 years, okay? Which then led to policy impact in, you know, US Army's branching uh, process, you know, COVID uh, allocation of, you know, vaccines and monoclonal antibodies. Uh, I was able to predict uh, a major development in India in affirmative action. Uh, so uh, in lecture two, what I'll do is I'll present the first direct application and subsequent proof of concept of minimalist, minimalist market design in the US Army's uh, branching process. Okay. So what is special about this particular application is from the beginning, I was following this paradigm. Like it's no longer, you know, I'm doing, you know, this just makes common sense. Like I have this template, I'm following it. Uh, uh, so the external validity of the, like something pretty interesting happened uh, in early 2010s. The reform that we guided at Boston Public Schools, like it had the following three main elements. There was a broken system. And there was the root cause of, so that was the reasons it was broken. And there was its resolution in a minimalist way, right? Now, external validity is very important in most sciences, right? And also in empirical work. Well, uh, this approach, you know, what happened in Boston received external validity in the following way. Both in England and Chicago, they had the same broken mechanism. They were corrected because of the same reasons, same root causes, 
And exactly in the same way, we suggested in Boston, right? But without any economist intervention. But that tells me that, you know, indeed, uh, so the idea that I'm trying to imitate, like to recover what policymakers were trying to do in the first place, uh, it's not unreasonable. Right? It happened in Chicago, it happened throughout England and uh, in uh, quite extreme ways. I will uh, talk about those in yeah. In lecture three, I will give another major uh, external validity. So we wrote this paper with uh, Bumin Yanmas about a flaw in a Supreme Court ruling uh, in 1995, which caused lots of troubles in India. It caused, uh, it caused at least, uh, you know, several thousand other lawsuits at high courts and Supreme Court level. Uh, with, there are three layers of the, of, uh, you know, courts in India. I don't know the number in the lower court. It's probably in the 10,000s, right? And there's been huge issues with, uh, uh, you know, uh, policy. And just as the paper was in the review period process at Econometrica, uh, the system corrected itself. The judges corrected the system exactly because of the reasons we mentioned and exactly in the way we mentioned, right? So basically, their judgment kind of looks uh, reads like my paper. Uh, yeah. I don't think they knew. I don't think they knew because uh, of the following reason. So I think this is truly external validity and not policy impact. Like that's my differentiation between policy impact. Like. I mean, I'll give some of the details, but they have horizontal reservations, they have vertical reservations, they are different kind of, you know, they correspond to different kind of mathematical operations. A horizontal reservation has to do with giving a minimum guarantee, but the standard choice rule, technical choice rule is a complicated object as far as practical people are concerned. Like you first have to allocate the, reserve positions, say for euros, and then everything else. This is not a straightforward idea for laymen. What is more straightforward is, you first look at all positions with merit and then do adjustments, right? Uh, they did the adjustment one, right? Whereas, uh, I mean, in my paper, I'm clear that you know, there are two variants of, like, you can obtain the same rule in two different ways. And one big theme that might appear to you in all these presentations is actually, you might have a mechanism or you can have a social choice rule. It might have different represent different formulas. You can get through deferred acceptance or you can get through, uh, uh, say, serial dictation, whatever. They are not the same. They are the same mechanism, but people might respond them in a different way because they might be emphasizing different aspects of the mechanism, right? And in a way, so like we are now getting into behavioral, uh, you know, uh, directions. And I will give you very concrete elements of that. So anyways, lecture three will be about affirmative action in India. Now, very conveniently, the applications in lecture two and lecture three, they gave me a unique resolution, which makes my life a lot easier. Right, uh, the problem solved. I have a very strong case. I say, okay, look, I'm looking at your history. Uh, obviously, this is what you are trying to do because that you say that's what you are trying to do. This is where you made a mistake. And this is the only way to fix it, right? That, 
proves proved to be a rather uh, you know, powerful tool uh, to convince policymakers. Okay. In lecture four, however, I will present another application about uh, Indian affirmative action, about the recent more controversial aspect of it. And there, the resolution is not unique. And there is a huge difference between different elements. Now, if we just give one of them as economists, we might be biasing system one way or another, and nobody would realize, right? So if we do not make it explicit, I mean, uh, nobody will realize. I mean, things which are a little bit simpler, people didn't realize, like even we didn't realize for many, many years. So layman will not uh, realize. Okay. So how did all, this all start? Well, this all started at Rochester. You know, I was a graduate student uh, in early 1990s, and I received my PhD at the, uh, under the guidance of William Thompson. Okay, so my coursework and like I was telling you, uh, I was a really bad student at college. Rochester was just intrigued with my father, right? I mean. How come this guy can be both so bad and also so good at the same time, right? You know, my file didn't make sense. And Rochester used to like taking risks like that. Uh, I mean, it was a harsh system. They get lots of people like me and then they kick out of the class. So, uh, uh, so I don't know if, uh, it's, if, this, this, uh, if this is the practice, but... Uh, my incoming class had more than, uh, like, I think we were, we started 46 people uh, and like 15 or 16 got degrees. Uh, anyways, but William's methodology, like his rigor, the way he thinks about problems was so appealing. Like I got mesmerized, mesmerized with the entire approach. Right, with mechanism design, with axiomatic approach to resource allocation. And then something really, really fortunate happened for me. So William was obsessed about, not obsessed, but very passionate about, so obsessed with the wrong <laughs> words, like extremely passionate with his students. Okay, like he was just a great family man. He was in his sabbatical year. So he didn't want to leave Rochester. So, and the idea of not teaching was very hurtful to him, right? And then he said, you know what? Why don't we all learn two-sided matching in a sabbatical year, okay? It turns out a few months before, Aldro sent him his manuscript. So let's learn this together, okay? So that became the basis of my, you know, thesis, right? So I figured, you know what, why don't we apply these, you know, mechanism design, axiomatic approach ideas to two-sided matching? Okay. So, but William put lots of emphasis on normative economics. And I was raised that. So I was, you know, a lot more accustomed to normative economics uh, than, you know, like students at more mainstream departments. So, so that affected the way I think about the problems. So in 1995, I defended a theoretical thesis on strategy improvements and implementation on matching markets, uh, really putting all these ideas together uh, at that point. Now, as I graduated, 1990s witnessed the emergence of a field now called market design, where researchers in auction theory and matching theory started playing active roles in design or reform of economic and social institutions. So the early successes were uh, uh, the design of the FCC spectrum, 
1994 and the redesign of the US medical residency match in 1997. In the case of FCC spectrum auction, a large number of uh, auction tiers were uh, you know, consultants uh, for the design, uh, most notably uh, John McMillan, who was a consultant for FCC, Paul Migram and Bob Wilson, who were consultants for uh, Pacific Telesis, and Preston McAfee as uh, consultant for Air Touch Communication. But I think that there were at least uh, a dozen other, uh, you know, tiers involved in that uh, project. So for the case of U.S. residence match, the redesign was commissioned by the National Resident Matching Program Board of Directors to Alden Road in 1995 due to an ongoing controversy, actually. Uh, and yes. So when you wrote your thesis, did you expect that the two-sided matching theory were going to have Lots of practical applications. I didn't expect or, anything. Oh, so I, so I, uh, you know, I, I, you know, I just allowed the rigor, though, right? Mechanism design was very systematic, very rigorous. Uh, uh, you know, I was even more excited about axiomatic, actually, uh, in part because of the you know normative content. And two-sided matching, it was, uh, uh, you know, very exciting, but it was a dormant field. Nobody was doing matching. Like, I think the last road work on these problems was like, you know, seven, eight years earlier, okay? And actually part of the reason I got excited is I thought, and there's very little normative in this stuff. Like the stability idea is completely positive concept, right? So, uh, but no, I didn't know. I mean, I certainly didn't expect uh, to be able to really? do uh, uh, what, what was coming. Uh, okay. So, but I mean, I was excited that, you know, theory can be relevant. Right. So I wanted to do the same thing. Right. I also wanted to change the world. Right. This was very inspired. Okay. And I started thinking on the problems that I am familiar with. Which problems was I familiar with? I was familiar with on-campus housing at University of Rochester. Right. I was familiar with college admissions in Turkey. Right. I, these are the problems I knew. Okay. But there was one big problem. Like, how would I go to, you know, authorities in college admissions in Turkey and tell them that, you know, they should change the system in this way or that way, right? I'm a nobody, right? Like, so I'm an outsider. Whereas earlier successes of market design was all through insiders, right? They didn't need to prove that there was an issue. People came to them because there was an issue, right? And then sometimes they're just trying to save face, policymakers. Like you can do experiments, you can do simulations. Uh, and as long as what you're doing is not unreasonable, as long as you can find a story for the public, boom, policy impact, right? How would that work for me, right? It wouldn't. So I figured, okay, I gotta do something else. And my plan was the follow. One thing I realized is the follow. When a design economist is commissioned to design a system, they almost never rework the theory. There is no need to do that. And it's also kind of, not everybody can do that, right? It requires particular kind of thinking, training. Like most people will go for empirical exercises, you know, behavioral exercises, uh, maybe a little, uh, a bit of politics. You know? uh, and so 
none of these would work for me. I knew nothing about empirical economics, experimental economics, and I'm not known for my soft skills, uh, right? So this wouldn't, none of these would work for me. So I said, you know what? In these problems, I don't think theory is utilized enough, right? Uh, so maybe I can get something more with theory. But for that, I need to go back to the primitives of the problem and rework the entire thing. And maybe I'll get something interesting, maybe I will not. Okay. But that was my only path. Now, my idea was I could make compelling normative points, which was missing in this two side matching theory. Right? And perhaps I could pitch my ideas as slight improvements of their ideas. Like that was my plan. Right, so I know that I'm not good with soft skills. I'm coming with bad news. Like people have all the reasons to get rid of me, right? And this is still the case. Uh, nobody's happy when I show up uh, saying, you know, you know, I have an improvement for you. Like nobody is excited to hear that because some of them prepared that system. They answer to people. Uh, like it looks like. Uh, you know, uh, I'm showing that they are doing something. Uh, they, they didn't do what they were supposed to do, right? Nobody is happy to hear that, right? So I said, okay, look, you know, I'll pitch this in such a way that I will not look that threatened. Okay. So the beginnings of this approach, minimalist market design, really starts with two papers uh, that I started working right after my graduation, literally on that summer. Balinski was 99 and Abdul Kadir also 99. They both start with a flawed real life mechanism that I was familiar with, that I was, that I participated in. Uh, guided by earlier pure theory, uh, in both papers, I developed a custom-made theory and only addressing the root cause of the flawed mechanisms, they both prescribed a minimally invasive alternative. I just didn't know it at the time. Okay, but uh, like if I were to use my framework now for these problems, I would have written those papers exactly there. Right. The flawed mechanisms they study and my vision of viable path to reform uh, them are reflecting in the modeling choice of both papers. So what I'll next to is, I'll talk about uh, Abu Khadr al 99 uh, and you know, how it affected uh, the way I model problems, uh, the way I seek solutions and such. Okay, now, uh, I said my talk will not be technical, but there will be a little bit of you know technicality, and I don't think this audience will be offended by that. Uh, so there are two types of agents, existing tenants and newcomers, and two types of houses, occupied and vacant. Agents have six preference over all houses. So I'm literally think of on-campus houses. Uh, each occupied house is owned by an existing tenant, like basically students who are not freshmen. And vacant houses are co uh, collectively owned by all agents. Like these houses, they don't belong to anybody. You know, it's for all students. Now, in the preliminary phase of the allocation process, each existing tenant is given two options. Why? Well, if nobody owned anything, you know, designing a system is kind of easy. And you can put people in a queue somehow, and then you can let them pick one at a time in a serial data sheet. But we have this individual rationality issue, right? So to deal with that, uh, policymakers ask, uh, uh, they're not policymakers, they are system operators at the University of Rochester, but this is a surprisingly common mechanism. Uh, uh, the options are you either keep your house and that's where you stay, or you give it up and enter 
the centralized process because central planners need to know what houses they have to allocate and who are the participants, right? Now, once the participants are determined, the final allocation is carried out uh, with uh, simple serial dictatorship. It's a very simple mechanism. What do you do? You sequence all participants in a queue in some way, uh, maybe with lottery, maybe based on exam scores, uh, whatever. Agents submit their stick preference over houses. And then the first agent in the line is assigned to her first choice. The second agent is assigned to her first choice among remaining houses, so on and so forth. So serious dictatorship is a very powerful idea. It, it embeds some sort of a normative idea, right? Uh, it has this idea of, you know, prior to list and prior to list ideas like very potent in many different settings. Okay. Now, but then because there is this preliminary phase, there is a bit of an issue because there are no guarantees to receive a bit of better house, keeping their occupied houses may be optimal for some existing tenants potentially compromising gains from trade, assuming that people know how to optimize this, by the way, right? Uh, if, you know, they are, uh, normally you cannot expect them really to know much about what will happen, make all these calculations. Typically they will even be more hesitant to participate, right? So, but yes. How, how was the ordering implemented? So it was random. In, in Rochester, it was random. Right. It was random. Yeah. Mm. Indeed, the paper talks about random serial dictatorship and squatting rights because of that, rather than serial dictatorship and squatting rights. So, in addition, so so first of all, there, the system is not individual rational necessarily because of that. It's not part of the efficient. And on top of that, there is also incentives to gain the system because of the earlier step is strategically complex, right? Mm -hmm. Who knows what that preliminary game looks like, right? It's a complicated uh, game. So, the root cause of all these failures is the lack of individual rationality. Like, this mechanism is not all that bad, actually. It's very intuitive. But there's one issue. It cannot encourage participation in a safe way. That's the only big issue, right? But I figure, you know what? Rather than coming up with something from scratch, I'll directly address this issue, okay? So here's a resolution in Abdul Qadir Ola and Surmas 99 that addresses the root cause of this failure. Apply the system without the preliminary phase as follows. Whatever way you want to order agents in a line, you still order them, just like the regular mechanism. You still ask people to submit their preferences. And then you use the mechanics of the serial dictatorship. You know, first guy gets his top choice, the next guy gets his top choice among the remaining houses, until someone demands the occupied house of an existing tenant. This is where things might get iffy, right? Well, I thought a natural thing to do at that point is, first of all, maybe the owner is already got. I don't need to worry at that point. You know, I don't need to do anything. Like the house was occupied, but not anymore. The owner is got. But otherwise, just with, before giving that house, just move this guy at the top of the queue and let him pick. Now, this is where, you know, 
train being trained in theory helps, right? Now, I can keep working with this idea as I proceed. The only observation that you have to do is this can end in one of two ways. Like that's the benefit of being a theorist, right? You will, you know, I want Puito's house, I get in front. Puito wants my house, he gets in front. And then I want his house, I get in front of him. He wants my house. Like after we do this 100 times, we figure, you know what? Like we stop all the queue, we've been, you know, getting in front of us. Why don't we just exchange these houses, right? And of course you don't do this 100 times, right? So the moment you see the same guy the second time in the queue, that has to be a cycle, right? It will either be like that or there will be a chain, right? Somebody like the guy who got in front, like Fuito wanted my house, he got in front, uh, but then he got an empty house and then I can grab his house, right? So either there will be a cycle or a chain. I view this as a minimal intervention of what they were doing, right? Now, this is kind of loose. Like I'm not completely precise, right? But, uh, but I think at an intuitive level, you see that. I'm really trying to do roughly what they are trying to do, uh, and, uh, but I'm trying to address lack of individual rationality. In doing so, uh, you know, no need to go through this exercise, but basically, uh, here, there are two types of objects. You either have cycles, which are these, you know, uh, where are cycles? Uh, yes, yeah, singleton cycle here. Oh, there's a singleton cycle here, two cycle here, so on and so forth. And then there are lots of chains. Right. Um, yes. I'm just curious. So, um, you know, because I, I learned this mechanism in your paper, so I, I kind of understand the uh, expose, but um, I wonder whether you also thought about some other mechanisms and so on. It's oh, clear that okay. you have to good. this mechanism right away. It's very good, very good. So, fantastic question. With those questions, the following. My presentation, in that paper is not ideal. I give the one person example, one existing example, I give this mechanism, right? But the general mechanism, I don't give this mechanism first. I give top trading cycles implementation of this mechanism. Why? because proofs are so much easier. So that was my mistake. Only then I say, you know what? There is another algorithm, which is equal. So that's another result in the same paper, right? But my initial start was with, was with this mechanism, right? Uh, it just happens that this mechanism also has an alternative representation, which is closely related to, you know, the stop trading cycles mechanism, right? And remember at the time, I don't have a framework. I'm just, you know, trying to design something make, which makes sense. It happens that there are two alternative ways I can formulate that mechanism, different algorithms, the same mechanism. And these different mechanisms have different advantages. The TTC version, you know, the proofs are easier. So uh, we, we made the main one. But this one is more intuitive. Like I can explain what it is doing to layman much more easily. So that's why with the motivating example, I gave this version actually at the beginning. Uh, so, so, so which one did you came, came up with first? So, uh, I mean, I came up with in the one person version. Okay. 
I came up with the, you request my house version. I sense the other one, okay, this will either give. Then I said, ah, okay, my, this is just a special way to get cycles in Gale stop dating cycles algorithm kind of setting. When, of course, you don't have, uh, like it's a different setting, right? You don't have private ownership like in Gale setting. You have, uh, you know, there are two types of uh, property rights in this setting. There's only one type of property right in the setting, but the mathematical idea is similar, right? Uh, I will give actually, uh, like some of these slides are about that. So indeed, you request my house, I get your turn, is the first one I came up with, uh, uh, but it was almost immediate to realize that, you know what? This is literally the same as, you know, Gale's mechanic with this interpretation of property rights, right? And then, oh, then I can prove it so easily. I don't need to worry too much about the new mechanics, right? That's why it's in the main body of the paper. Well, well I mean, they're all in the main body of the paper, but... Uh, uh, so this procedure integrates Allocation of unit to an indivisible goods when property rights come in one of, uh, in the following two forms. Private ownership via free trade and public ownership via allocation and trade of priority. Right? So effectively, this through this procedure, I'm integrating two types of property rights. Right? And then conveniently it reduces the simple city dictatorship if the problem is house allocation, meining there are no existing tenants or, or occupied houses. And to get updating cycles procedure uh, for the case of housing markets. Strictly speaking, this doesn't reduce the get updating cycles procedure. Get updating cycles procedure doesn't specify how you find the cycles. Whereas this one gives you explicit sequence of cycles. Right? So, uh, but this would be one way to implement the stop trading cycles algorithm. The stop trading cycles algorithm just says, there is a cycle, find it, blah, blah, blah. You don't need to like, so my design is constructive. Uh, uh, I mean, minimal difference, of course, but whatever. So it turns out that this mechanism also inherits plausible properties of its predecessors. It's individual parity efficient and strategy proof, right? So basically it corrects all flaws of the civil dictatorship with supporting rights with minimal interference. I was very excited about this paper. Uh, I still am. Uh, uh, I think Vanessa and Summers and this paper, I'll take it's these papers which made me who I am. Uh, okay. So I'm presenting this at a few places. In two places, Carnegie Mellon and Northwestern. I explicitly remember actually Benny Moldovan, I think he was visiting uh, Northwestern. And he asked me, why do you, like, if all you are trying to Get is individualization of the partisan strategic progress. Why do you bother with all this stuff? Why not give vacant houses to newcomers? Existing tenants already have their houses and find the unique core outcome of the induced economy through Gale's mechanism. Yes, stop doing cycles mechanism. At the time I said the following, okay, look, your method only works if there are at least as many agents as houses, whereas my method is more general, okay? But I felt that I'm cheating. Like, I felt like I'm missing something. 
I'm missing part of the answer. Okay, like I was like, it's a good answer, but I wasn't satisfied with my answer. Okay, so his suggestion, let me call it the technocratic solution. Okay. First of all, normal person will not come up with this mechanism. Uh, you got to know about you know these uh, problems, right? Uh, but that's perfectly fine. That's what's good about being a tier. So we know all this cool stuff. Okay, but to a tier list, this is a more natural mechanism. Would you agree? If you know, you know, if you are familiar with tier stop trading cycles mechanism, I mean. It's a more natural mechanism, except I save myself because mine deals with uh, you know the case where we have more uh, houses than people, do, whereas this one doesn't. Let's suppose you have exactly the same number of houses and agents. So my escape is completely gone. Let me tell you something. So shortly after I published these papers, I moved to Turkey. I did one of the best things I did in my professional life. I recruited Utkuru. Okay. And the first thing I ask him is to prove this theorem. Okay. And the theorem is the following. The technocratic solution is not just any solution. It's the same mechanism as a special case of my mechanism. You request my house, I get your turn, where you do something special with the queue. Remember, you request my house, I get your turn mechanism is parameterized with a queue. Right? And if you put each newcomer at the top of the queue and all uh, uh, existing talents are at the back of the queue and randomly rank newcomers, and at that point, it doesn't actually matter how you rank existing talents as long as they are at the bottom, their ranking is irrelevant. If you want, you can also put them, uh, rank them randomly, but it will not matter. Okay. This gives exactly the same thing, same outcome as a technocratic solution. So, of all things I can do with my mechanism, what they suggest is a very specific member which favors newcomers as much as you can subject to the condition that you are fair you know you are you treat them equally now is this what most housing offices really want to do like try you know give higher priority to newcomers compared to existing tenants right so basically what i'm saying is there is a subtle bias in the tiers mechanism. And why is it happening? Well, it's happening because think about the property rights. Occupied houses are owned by their owners, right? What about vacant houses? They are owned by everybody, not by newcomers. By randomly giving vacant houses to newcomers, you are removing their ability to trade through these houses. But that's a really sneaky way to include a bias to a system, isn't it? Right? So nobody will realize this. So the point is sometimes if you don't cook theory from scratch, if you don't do custom made theory, you can add major bias, algorithmic bias in the systems 
you might not be able to realize it. No, and if you don't realize it, nobody will realize it. All right? So, you know, like this is one of the main reasons why, uh, you know, I included house allocation in this presentation, even though, you know, no policy impact ever happened. So, yes. Oh. Right, just so, uh, <clears throat> there are two mechanisms here. One is yours, and the other is technocratic. Solution. And do you say that your, your mechanism is a minimalistic solution, but technocratic solution is not? So, technocratic solution is definitely not, that is like, it is making some assumptions. And the assumption, specific assumption it is making is, it is messing with the property rights. Except it's doing it in a very sneaky way. So like, uh, you know, if you don't see this paper, you'll not know actually that bias is there. Now, in the last 20 years, I've seen that that sort of thing happened, sometimes by mistake, sometimes intentionally uh, in real life problems, in much more important problems. Uh, okay, so I got some rough idea of minimalistic mechanisms, but is there any way to mathematically formulate the definition of minimalistic mechanisms? So uh, oh, that would be a fantastic project, and I'm hoping you guys will do that. I don't think there will be a single model for that, but I think this is a very interesting problem. I think you'll need to put like this organism structure that I have in mind. I think you'll need to put some structure there. Uh, uh, so uh, unfortunately, I don't have a theory of minimalist market design just yet. Very, very interesting observation is your mechanism has two representations, right? Very natural one and theoretical one. A natural one looks like minimalist. And so the amazing but, but uh, uh, so well, well the technocratic one is a special case of my mechanism, right? Yeah. yeah, and the way it's special makes the bias of this, mm -hmm. right? Wanda, uh, as a related question, uh, so in your uh, house allocation with the equal 1999 uh, paper, um, so you have these two representations, so. I wonder if uh, uh, you could put uh, the representation in, in, the, in the lab, for example, and see how- So actually, uh, I started a research program exactly about these questions with Alex Rees Jones recently, uh, not just for that mechanism, for many other mechanisms. And I think we have a paper with Parak Patak, Alex Rees Jones in forthcoming in management science, it's called reversing reserves. It is a little bit related. So I believe the representation of mechanism is a lot more important than its mechanics. But so I think there's a whole line of uh, behavioral uh, uh, elements here. I think more interesting lab experiment is present two versions to policymakers. And uh, which one they choose? Uh, yeah. <laughs> right. And indeed, we did stuff like that uh, for reserve, not for the uh, So, although you request my house, I get your term was uh, developed as a minimally invasive alternative to a real life house allocation mechanism, it was never pursued, at least by me, for practical implementation. Okay. My first policy interactions took place in 1997 with Turkish officials on centralized assignment of high school graduates to colleges. So Balinski, that's Balinski Sörmas. It plays an important role in my career. It was my first research project where I paid close attention to institutional details and interacted with authorities upon completion for possible policy impact. It was my first integrated effort in research on policy, which uh, relied on normative economics to pursue a reform of a major real life institution. It was also my first failure in my policy efforts, the earliest one of many to come. 
but not without teaching me several valuable lessons that influence the evolution of my minimalist approach to market design. Okay. Now, allocation of school seats centrally based on performance metric is a widespread practice worldwide. It's very common, right? The solution to this problem is straightforward when all seats are identical at a single institution. What do you do? You do priority admissions, like people with the highest priority get the slots. Priority admission also is a straightforward generalization when there are multiple institutions, provided that they all priority list applicants with the same performance metric, then we have simple serial detection, right? Same idea. And what is important is both priority admissions and simple serial dictatorship, these are easy mechanisms to be invented by the layman, right? And uh, that's why you see it everywhere. Now, overcoming favoritism and corruption is one of the main reasons why so many countries or local authorities allocate school seats centrally using an objective performance metric. And assuming that the assignment rule respects the performance metric, i.e. each school has a minimum cutoff score uniformly applied for all students, this practice increases legitimacy of the process. Okay, so this naturally led to the following axiom. Remember, I was trained uh, uh, in a very axiomatic way. My mindset is very axiomatic. Now, this condition, which I called fairness in Balinski Sunmas, and then elimination of justified and in Abdul Qadir Sunmas. I think now I'm we are kind of settling to no justified that way. Basically, it means it says. No student should ever lose a seat to another student who has still a lower performance score, right? Why? Because otherwise, what's the point of having that metric evaluation? Now, conceptually, this has nothing to do with stability. Nobody is doing blocking or anything, right? Uh, but it's mathematically related to stability. If I interpret prior to ranking as a preference ranking, like why? Because they are mathematically the same object. There is an isomorphism, but they are very different ideas. You'll not be able to explain stability to the policymakers. And I don't think, I think stability is hugely overrated. It's not stability doing the job. Like you cannot do blocking in many applications. And when you explain to policymakers, they don't understand what you are trying to do. But if you talk about no justify them, don't tell them, no just, you, you can talk about either, you know, minimum cutoffs, you know, we are enforcing these priorities that we put, everybody understands, right? So importantly, unlike stability, which is a positive criteria, no justify them is a normative criteria. Okay. And, an outcome be supported by minimum cutoff scores if and only if it satisfies no justified end. So there is very strong link between this cutoff idea and no justified end. Okay. Now, so when all institutions use the same performance metric, the problem is straightforward and single serial, simple serial dictatorship is the only direct mechanism that satisfies paradigms and no justified end. This mechanism also happens to be strategical. So basically, if all evaluations are identical at, across all schools, the problem is very simple. The solution is simple. The nature of solution that people come up with satisfies all the good properties that you expected. So this problem of the version of the problem is straightforward. But if you complicate the problem a little bit, in a number of ways. For example, if you had heterogeneity on school priorities, if, if you had some distributional constraints, maybe you give some option to improve your priority in a costly way, you pay extra dollars. The problem gets analytically more complex and the concept of no justified envy also gets more complex, right? 
And even the policymakers might feel what they are doing, they'll not be able to formulate. And, uh, and then uh, it's not very hopeful that they will be able to find the exact mechanism to do what they are intended. And you know, many of the coming lectures, you know, uh, the, the, like two, three, or four, like they are actually dealing with various versions of the same idea. So basically, policymakers and system operators often tend to rely on some basic and often rudimentary modifications of simple serial dictatorship or priority admission to solve this more complex version of the problem. And typically, when they do that, the idea that like the uh, is not the starting good idea anymore, even though it's built on it. And and typically because they couldn't do what I what they intended to do, at least in many of the situations. Okay. So then my idea is, you know what? If I can figure out what they try to do, and if I do it, maybe I can convince them. Right. Okay, so one uh, way to deal with heterogeneity on school priorities is the following. Processing high rank choices before low rank one is a compelling idea for the layman. Let me first deal with first choices, so on, so on. This idea reflects itself by the repeated use of priority admissions in the Boston mechanism. So I'm here kind of trying to represent Boston mechanism as a rudimentary adjustment of these basic versions of the mechanism. That's what I'm trying to do here, right? So basically, what do you do? Considering first choice of each student, allocate seats with priority admissions. And for the remaining seats, do the same thing, so on and so forth. But when you do this, it neither satisfies, nor justifies them with no strategy purpose anymore. Right? Like this rudimentary adjustment, it is simple, it's very popular, but it's nothing like its base mechanism in terms of its performance. Now, while the single standard like this is used to allocate all college seats in Turkey, what they do is by using different weights for its various sections, multiple performance rankings of students are constructed from this test. So basically they map you know, engineering schools to one uh, weighting, medical schools to another weighting, so on so forth. And they use the exact same uh, test, but they create multiple rankings. Depending on field, okay. So the resulting heterogeneity in college priorities deem one shot application of simple serial dictatorship uh, inapplicable at that point. Now, just like Boston mechanism uses, repeatedly uses priority admissions, Turkish college admission mechanism was based on repeated application of simple serial dictatorship, right? So they also had a uh, maybe less rudimentary adjustment. What do they do? For each performance ranking, you tend to assign seats to related colleges with simple serial dictatorship. But when you do that, students will, some students will get multiple assignments if they have schools in their rankings uh, with these different mapped rankings. Okay. Then what you do is you chop the preference of the students in such a way that Anything less than their top choice that are they are assigned is removed so that you know those resources are not wasted. Now that's a new preference profile. Do exactly the same thing until you know this procedure um, until nobody gets more than a uh, uh, single assignment. Okay, so I have this example which I will skip, uh, and I think my son Art will. I don't like that, uh, I'm skipping it. Uh, so it's a straightforward idea. It's amazing how slow I am. Uh, so at first glance, 
this mechanism seems to be a pretty compelling mechanism, right? For example, it satisfies no justified end. If it didn't, the outcome would uh, be a regularly challenging court action. Uh, but there's several limitations. Its outcome can be Pareto dominated by an outcome which also satisfies no justified end. Rate. It is not strategy group. It does not respect improvements in performance scores in the sense that if some, it's possible that somebody might be assigned a lower rank school just because of a higher score. Okay. And a close inspection reveals the source of these limitations. This mechanism is equivalent to doing the following. Take college admissions, uh, take the Turkish problem. Remember that for each school, there is an associated ranking uh, of schools. Interpret that as the preferences of this school, which satisfies response on this property, and find the college optimal stable matching of the resulting outcome. Okay, so these mechanisms are identical. But then once you make that observation, it's kind of obvious that this mechanism is no good. Why would you want to use college optimal stable mechanism when colleges are not agents, but rather public goods to be allocated, right? So in a way, once you see that equivalence, the problem is obvious. Now, this line of reasoning also comes with the solution of this problem. Well, do the same thing, except, you know, choose the student optimal stable matching of the sister economy, okay? Now, this mechanism is often called deferred acceptance mechanism these days. I never liked it. I, unfortunately, I also sometimes say it. Why? Well, because deferred acceptance is just only one way to get that outcome. It's just one algorithm which gives that mechanism, the outcome of that mechanism. I can have different procedures which gives the same thing. And they can have different uh, like uh, aspects which might be visible. Uh, and I think this is a little bit related to, you know, positive versus normative focus and so on and so forth. But I think this is especially important for behavioral uh, purposes. Anyways, now the case for this mechanism is very strong. If no justified envy is indispensable, Sinoto stable mechanism Pareto dominates any other mechanism that satisfies no justified envy. It is the only mechanism that satisfies no justified then the individual rationality, non wastefulness and strategy goodness. Or it's the only mechanism that satisfies no justified then the individual rationality, non wastefulness and respect for improvement. Like, like, it's very difficult to fight this mechanism, right? If no justified envy is something you cannot give up and you cannot uh, enter because of loss. Right. Otherwise, you cannot have cut off scores. Um, yes. Question. So, uh, okay. So, you, okay. So, um, so you, you just showed uh, the. I see that. So, I'm so, kind of wondering. Um, so, uh, uh, a little bit about the description of the mechanism. So, um, the the original Turkish mechanism uh, appears to be reasonably close to the CL dictatorship. Uh, I wonder if you thought about um, some description of the SOFM uh, mechanism that are uh, kind of close to the CIA dictatorship. Uh, do you know whether that's possible? I do not know. Not the role I was highly influenced by, like I'm a theorist after all, but the way I thought was, I know the objectives of these people, and they give one mechanism anyways. Like whenever that happens, I thought that is the minimalist outcome. So, so in a way, I'm dealing with a simpler case uh, where the mission of the institution itself gives a unique mechanism anyways. I don't need to push too much to make this look like a small altering of what they are doing. And remember, this was a time where all of this is instinctive, uh, like this minimalist market design. Uh, 
So it is these applications which kind of clarify the broader paradigm. But I wasn't following a paradigm. But I mean, I was very proud of this paper. And uh, before I submitted this paper for publication, I approached policymakers and said, okay, you got to change your mechanism. And, uh, and this was a time where phone call was very expensive, like one and a half dollars a minute. I mean, uh, and you know, I didn't have any funding. Uh, so, uh, and fortunately and unfortunately, I'm a kind of pushy guy, you know, sometimes good, sometimes not good. So I did my best before I submitted the paper for publication. Why? Because I want to solve the problem. I'm, that's bigger, it's more important for me than publishing. After several correspondence with their physical mail and meeting with the head of the centralized clearing house, I received a formal letter from Ankara that kindly turned down my proposal. Okay, so this is the letter, November 1997. And on the right side is the translation to English, direct translation. So they say, the model is scientifically consistent, it carries academic value. Okay, good, good job. Uh, there can be multiple solutions that respect the cutoff condition. Their system gives one of them. The one I propose gives another. And there can be others. They figure that out. While in theory, they can give very different outcomes from a practical perspective, this is a very low probability event. So that's what they are cl claiming. And I think they are right. And the base of that claim is the following. They said, we run this with 1997 data and your procedure give exactly the same outcome. So we understand your examples where they are different, but it seems like a rare case. So in the light of this, there's no need to change anything. Okay. So what did I learn from this? First of all, I was happy that you know, my proposal received serious consideration. So the diligence of the leadership gave me the hope that perhaps next time I might so succeed with more careful planning. Given the emphasis on solutions that respect cutoff scores, I was correct my, in my hypothesis that at least in the Turkish context, no justified envy was the most important desiderant. Okay, that was the big deal. On the other hand, the authorities did not even comment about lack of strategy proofness, respect for priority improvements, or even potential parity inferiority of the mechanism. Why? Because these things are invisible to them. I'm a theoretical guy, a theorist who is creating a problem where there is none in the field. While they acknowledge that the two mechanisms can generate different outcomes, so due to their simulations, they figured, you know, this will not happen. So in retrospect, my failure made complete sense. I was an outsider who arrived with bad news. I found fault in a mechanism which had been working without issue for years. How would they justify a reform to their superiors or to the public? Like because of this, you know, random guy. Uh, why admit an issue when the system was working just fine, right? So I got two important lessons from this experience. I learned that no matter how accurate my model and clear my analysis might be, theoretical analysis alone will not cut it for my policy ambitions. I have to present more concrete value to the stakeholders, no matter how I do it. And second, how could the mechanism I advocate is unlikely to be important for the authorities unless I show that their current mechanism is also really bad, okay? I had to support my normative analysis with positive economics. A reform doesn't start with a good mechanism. A, start, a reform starts with a really bad mechanism, at least when you're an outsider. Like I have, I don't, I haven't seen any exception to that. So seven years later, 
these two lessons guide my interactions with the authorities at Boston Public. Okay. So, uh, just quickly, um, so do you know whether this um, data analysis that the was did was it replicated for the other years? I didn't communicate with them after the following years. So, so it's not very easy to interact with uh, bureaucrats in Turkey. Uh, So shortly after my policy failure in Turkey, it became clear that the relevance of Balinski and Summers goes well beyond the top Turkish college admissions. Most notably, as part of a policy called school choice in the US, K-12 admissions at public schools were carried out with similar centralized clearinghouses in many large school districts. School choice was advocated by various groups as a more equitable alternative to neighborhood assignment. At first, school choice seemed fully isomorphic to Balinski Summers. The only difference was rather than standardized tests, in most school districts, other criteria determined school priorities. So perhaps there was no need for formal analysis, right? After all, we already declared the stable mechanism as an unambiguous winner. But for at least three reasons, I thought it was valuable to explore mechanisms which failed to satisfy no justified enemy. The first reason was while full enforcement of priorities is compelling, no matter how priorities are obtained, it was less clear how essential it was when they are not earned through effort. Okay. The second, of all school choice mechanisms in the US, I documented uh, in Abdul Qadir al None of them satisfied no, no, no justified values. Obviously, it cannot be that important if none of the systems satisfy. And there was another reason, theoretical reasons. In settings with heterogeneous school priorities, no justified enemy is no longer compatible with priority efficiency. It's compatible if all schools have the same priority ranking, but not there is heterogeneity. And I had all this urge to go beyond, you know, not just white enemy enemies because of that inefficiency. So basically, in, the implication is full enforcement of priorities was not uh, free, at least for some priority structures. Okay, I think uh, you all know this example. So, but then, my earlier work on house allocation with the existing tenants and the TTC representation, not the you request my house, but I got your turn uh, version, can be easily modified for school choice. All I needed to do was adding heterogeneity to that priority ranking, which was unique. Uh, but from the aspect of the mechanics of the second algorithm, it didn't make a difference. So basically, I propose a TTC uh, for this version of the problem. And conceptually, if you want to compare, like Gale's TTC, you request my house, I get your turn, equivalent TTC, and school choice TTC. Gale's TTC is a trade of private loan houses. You request my house, I get your turn version of TTC or equivalent TTC is trade of privately owned houses and priorities for all available houses. The middle version is the most sophisticated version, actually. Whereas the school choice TTC is just trade of, tri uh, trade of priorities, right? But it's roughly the same idea. And this mechanism is part of the efficient individual strategy proof and respect for improvements. Like all these failures of the uh, Boston mechanism, for instance, or uh, not about the mechanism, but the Turkish mechanism. This mechanism for uh, exit, except no justified them, right? So in Abdul Qadir Summers, we propose two mechanisms for school tours. Right? I cannot tell how important it is to enforce priorities fully. Like it's not. It has to be determined by the society, also, right? But we suggested 
swing of the stable mechanism is no justified and is indispensable. And TTC, if part efficiency is more important than no justified and. But my experience with Turkish officials suggests that merely proposing a good mechanism is not likely to compel policymakers to adopt these mechanisms. We had to establish that their current mechanism is really bad. Right? That's what I learned. So then I set my eye on the Boston mechanism, right? So that was the bad mechanism I would go after. It had very strong incentives or preference manipulation. It was by far the most popular mechanism in late 1990s. It was the only mechanism that I have seen in multiple school districts. Any other mechanism I've seen was at only a single place. And in half of the places, they use the Boston mechanism because I think it's a very simple idea, repeated use of basically uh, prior to admission. Okay. Now, unlike the Turkish college admission mechanism, a subtle aspect of the Boston mechanism creates some anxiety in the field. Lack of incentive compatibility was not an issue in Turkey. But college at a stable mechanism, nobody can manipulate. It's just a theoretical exercise. And we know it can be, you know, because we have tears. But, uh, but Boston mechanism was not like that, right? And there were newspaper stories about that in many places. Like, yep, it's complicated. If you care where your kid ends up, you have to be savvy and alert, make a realistic choice, because if you don't, you'll mess up. You know, like this was already causing lots of tension in many places. So I knew that, unlike in the Turkish case, this is a problem, right? So these discoveries suggest that authorities who rely on Boston mechanism could be more receptive to my reform efforts than their Turkish counterparts, okay? But before making any move, this time, I decided to build a much stronger case against this, against the Boston mechanism. Okay, but I ran lab experiments with Yan Chen. I did equilibrium analysis with uh, Haluk Ergin, just to show that you know what, uh, you know my student of those stable mechanism is more efficient than anyways. So, so that I have a you know better portfolio. Finally, one timely development in September 2003, just two months after the paper got published, created a golden opportunity to approach the leadership at Boston Public Schools. Okay. Soon after it appeared in print, Boston Globe published a story on Abu Ghadirol and Sonos. So who knows? Reporters was really, you know, following you know, academic journalists, right? <laughs> And we talked a few hours, and Garrett Cook wrote a wonderful story. The story included interviews with frustrated parents, BPS officials, and members of the school, uh, Boston School Committee. Okay, and the story had, you know, statements like that. Officials with the Boston Public Schools and the Boston School Committee readily acknowledged that. Parents are frustrated with the current system and officials said at the school committee meeting this week that they would make changing the system a priority. Oren, who is the chief of staff, said that he was intrigued by the economics work and considered their suggestion a serious alternative. Somebody, a parent said, uh, uh, all parents interviewed by the Globe said it would be a huge relief simply to write a truthful answer to the question, what school do you want? Right. A lot of alienation some parents have towards the choice system is solely attributable to the alienation of not making your uh, first choice, uh, your, your first choice, your first choice, right? So there were statements like that. So this gave me all the ammunition I need. So what did I do? I send a huge package to, yes. So do you know why? Uh... Boston Globe paid attention to your, your paper you, because you know, because uh, like uh, of the Boston mechanism, like the bad like one of the main bad mechanisms was the Boston mechanism. You, usually, newspaper people don't read uh, uh, economic junk. So this did... guy did, and actually, he won a Pulitzer Prize later on uh, with another piece. 
uh, not with this piece. So uh, we were very lucky. Like we didn't recruit him, he found us. Okay. Uh, so uh, by chance. Okay, good. But it's also, it's also suggestive. Like your examples in the paper are important. How you present your ideas are important. Uh, maybe even the title of the uh, uh, mechanism was important. Uh, so I signed a package with all my relevant papers, my proposal, and uh, and then surprisingly, I received a reply message from Walid Edmonds, who is the strategic planning manager at PPS. I had a phone call with her discussing my proposal and explaining my underlying motives. They were very suspicious. They accused the enormous. They actually forgot. Like when they are responding, they forgot to delete the background discussion at PPS. <laughs> uh, so I could see the entire discussion starting with my message. And the first message after me, mine was like, take care of this. Uh, okay. Actually, seriously, I, I actually I want to ask you. So, well, I I was guessing that the uh, BPS may be quite annoying. Uh, like, very annoyed. So, so uh, everybody's annoyed with BPS. Okay. Like, uh, so, uh, so, 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 so okay. this course is about how I turn the tables, basically. Yeah, actually, uh, I, I was uh, curious as to uh, what kind of care you uh, I, I will, uh, yeah. So at the beginnings, they were upset about the mayhem caused by the Boston Globe story. Uh, maybe there was a problem, but the Globe story made the problem a lot bigger. They also alerted me that they have no funding for me for any possible interaction. So, and I wasn't asking any money for me in the first place. Like my motivations are, purely you know academic and policy oriented and all these years uh, I knew all my work is pro bono but we never uh, received any funding uh, for any of our policy so we my assurances then facilitated an invitation to BPS I was in Istanbul to present the details of the proposed reform and expected benefits to the city. With the approval of BPS leadership, I invited Attila Abdul Kodiro and then Boston based Alvin Roth to the meeting. So in October 2003, I gave a presentation to BPS officials on the merits of the proposed reform. Roth joined the meeting with Parak Patak, who was then a first year graduate student at Harvard University. In that presentation, it became clear that it was mainly the incentive compatibility considerations that secured that particular meeting. That was the big deal there. Not no justified enemy, but rather uh, manipulability. And although I mainly pitched spin optimal stable mechanism for a possible reform, Valerie Edwards explicitly inquired about our thoughts on TTC. So they were very well prepared, right? Now, at the end of that, by the end of that meeting, the authorities were convinced that Boston mechanism does not serve the city well, and it likely alters the submitted preferences. So this was my all time most successful meeting. Uh, relying on preference data uh, to, uh, to, uh, as a school popularity, they were wary of possible disconnect between submitted and true preferences because they were evaluating schools based on this thing. Right? There were lots of problems about potentially manipulated data. And they were convinced that strategic mechanism will increase transparency and parental satisfaction. So they immediately decided to form a student assignment task force to evaluate the city's assignment process, including our proposed reform. Right? That's not a serious place. And you cannot just you know, change their mechanism overnight. And something very surprising happened. In a, about a year later, task force formally recommended TTC. Okay. Now, providing us with student preference data, authorities requested an empirical analysis of the strategic behavior under the Boston mechanism. Why? Right? Because you have to justify this reform the people of the city, right? And school committee. Now, 
In May 2005, public meeting of the school committee, DPS officials announced their recommendation to discard the Boston mechanism. These are their slides. First of all, these are not my slides. These are the slides from Boston Public Schools. So what is the problem with the Boston mechanism? It forces families to strategize. That's not good. It makes it a high stakes gamble for families undermines families' trust in the system. Families should not have to sacrifice their true preferences. Uh, so on, so forth. Like the system, not families, should compensate. That means we got to create a secure environment to reveal preferences, right? Parents should, shouldn't need to, you know, uh, hit their brains. Uh, now, the BPS officials emphasized the appeal of adopting a strategy proof mechanism in promoting transparency and leveling the uh, uh, playing field. So observe that strategy proof is different than dominant strategy incentive compatibility, even though it's the same mathematical relation. You care for dominant strategy incentive compatibility as a constraint to the extent it serves your objective. It's a constraint for you. Whereas strategy proofness, which has the same mathematical formula, is an objective in itself, right? And this is also very related to, you know, Positive economists given too much importance to you know consequentialist outcomes and nothing else and so on and so forth, right? So these normative justifications for strategy proofness, a first in public uh, debate, uh, we formalize it product later on. Okay. Now, Despite the test for recommendation, BPS support is not a stable mechanism. And the recommendations directly driven by no justified and we have strategic problems. If you look at it. Okay. Interesting. Despite this parity efficiency strategy and strategy problems and the support of the task force, authorities were hesitant to recommend TPC. What are the main reasons? Failure of no justified envy, and importantly, perceptions. Even though TTC is strategy proof, it might not appear strategy proof. That's what they were worried about. They were worried about the behind the scene trade of the priorities. These are not consequentialist considerations. The reform didn't happen because of you know, positive economics, right? And uh, this is something I learned at BPS and uh, which I, it was confirmed later on. Okay. Oh, oh, I, um, I, I always say that this, uh, uh... Uh, this uh, when I teach, but we, some students uh, think that the uh, the uh, so time mechanism may be uh, as hard to understand as the TTC. So, so you don't need to understand the mechanics of SOSM. There is a simple way to explain SOSM. SOSM is the best way to enforce priorities. It also happens to be strategy proof. So it cannot, it should never be the task of subjects or parents to prove the properties of a mechanism. And this is related to this, you know, behavioral aspects, different versions. Why this approach that I'm promote, promoting now is successful is nobody cares about the mechanism. But if we can divide the mechanism into simple pieces, into simple explanations, you know. Like if you can give, okay, your priorities, I will enforce them. And in doing so, I will assign them as high as I can. 
And incidentally, this process cannot be manipulated. This is something can be, that can be conveyed to parents. TTC is harder to explain. Like if you have to explain, okay, it's also strategy group, whatever, but you have to trade priorities. Uh, it explains that uh, when we explain this, um, uh, it's not just the MB and the student of the MIT, then, then people kind of take that as a- So the dating, okay, so this makes sense, right? If they find it plausible. And uh, right. By the way, I completely messed up my presentation, uh, and I will go a little bit above. But uh, like the entire part with kidney exchange, I'll stop and then I'll figure out whether I finish this or like uh, I'll have to do. Uh, this is the first time I'm giving this lecture, so but I'll finish the part with school jobs and uh, skip the part with uh, you know kidney exchange and liver exchange. So in June 2005, the Boston School Committee voted to replace the Boston mechanism with student optimal stable mechanism. The city adopted SOSM starting with the next school year and has been using it for allocation of K-12 public school seats since then, along with a similar reform in New York City and similar in court, because I think they are not similar. Uh, the BPS school choice reform triggered a series of similar reforms worldwide later on. <laughs> so the strong role of various axioms in both successful policy efforts in Boston and the earlier unsuccessful ones in Turkey played an instrumental role in evolution of minimalist market design. And the key lesson that I learned was what really matters for various stakeholders is the underlying principles and not specific mechanisms. Mechanisms are just too complicated. And that's the appeal of axiomatic approach. I mean, I think we can do what I'm doing in different ways too, but uh, I find axiomatic approach particularly helpful to convey ideas to uh, policymakers and uh, laymen. Not all similar reforms that follow were guided by design economists. Some involved naturally giving external validity to the joint research and policy framework, which I now call minimalist market design. So, so basically, uh, I mean, we made a number of important observations. First, we observed that incentive compatibility, it's a design objective in itself. And we've made that point in uh, Patagon Summers 2013. Okay. And this directly challenges consequentialist approaches. And most economics framework, mainstream, they are even utilitarian, even a stricter subset of consequentialism, right? And you cannot change your life, institutions like that. Okay. So what is the driving force of reforms? Now, a significant feature of minimized market design is that it is driven more by underlying principles than the procedural details. And there are two big stages. And the first stage you don't have at all when you are commissioned to design a system. The first stage is the persuasion stage, right? Like you got to establish that. You got to change the system. They got to change the system. And to do so, you need to identify what is it that they want, right? You cannot just make up. Let's maximize this, let's maximize that, and then look at the equilibrium outcome. That will never work, but it will never work. It will only work with journal editors and referees, and you'll be very famous, you'll publish lots of papers, you'll make zero policy impact, unless you're commissioned. You got so famous that you start getting commissioned, then you can do whatever you do. Okay? But if you're like me, you gotta develop persuasion. And I found this, very helpful. So you have to identify what matters for policymakers, and you have to verify visible and consequential failures. Right? The problem needs to be obvious. It has needs to hurt them, or you know, you have to have a carrot and a stick in your presentation. Okay. So in the absence of a well-executed 
persuasion stage of the reform advocacy, my thesis is stakeholders ignore any efforts for policy change. Okay. Now this stage is bypassed under commission market design. So I said entirely different. And persuasion stage was missing in my failed reform uh, attempt in Turkey. Like I didn't have the person, like I was too much of a tourist, right? And then you have the enhancement stage for reform advocacy. It's the formulation of a better institution, but it will only be taken seriously if there is a very strong persuasion stage. Okay. Now I'll make two, three additional points and I'll finish and then I'll figure out what to do with the missing material. Uh, so, minimalist market design, it imitates natural evolution, or at least I aspire that it imitates natural evolution, right? I'm basically trying to do what they couldn't and convince them that it is what I'm doing that they wanted to do. Okay. So in the case of BPS, school choice reform, in the persuasion stage, Identification of incentive compatibility as key desiderata, desiderata and verification of the excessive vulnerability of the Boston mechanism to preference manipulation. That was the persuasion stage. Okay. In the enhancement stage, we explored you know, various incentive compatible mechanisms and city maintenance choice. Now, ideally, the two stage process of reform advocacy under minimalist market design, it imitates the nature. Uh, evolution uh, of an institution, lack of formalism or technical limitations often result in mistakes when an institution is designed by layman. The main objective under minimum market design is formulate the intended MAC institution. And I know that this idea works because it received external validity uh, in the following way. So basically, External validity is very important in many sciences, right? We don't have in theory, but here I have external validity. And, and show me external validity for other designs, which doesn't follow this pattern. So I will show you the external validity in the following sense. I will give you two reforms without getting, getting into details. In England, Boston mechanism became illegal in the entire country because of incentive considerations. And as a result, they adopted, they uh, required all school district called localities to adopt syndrome stable mechanism. They gave up the same mechanism because of the same reason and adopted the same resolution, but without any economist effort. Same thing happened in Chicago uh, and it happened more abruptly. They gave up their system in the middle of the allocation process. It has to be so bad that they gave up the Boston mechanism due to exactly the same reasons and they adopted the serial uh, dictatorship because they had just one uh, single ranking. So it's generalizational. It's, it's a special case of uh, syndrome stable mechanism. Okay. So, so basically, I see this as a external validity of the paradigm itself rather than syndrome stable mechanism. Right. Okay. I will make one last contrast. I'll contrast this with 2003 New York City school choice reform. Now, another successful application of market design in mid 2000s was the economist guided adoption of pseudo optimal stable mechanism for allocation of uh, public high schools in New York City. And since both BPS and New York City adopted versions of pseudo optimal stable mechanism, the success of these applications were attributed to similar reasons. Okay. But I think the, the situations were completely different. So, and I think bundling these two applications, and that wasn't my doing, uh, shifted the focus too much into 
technical aspects of these designs, like to stability, the vertex axis. It put focus into completely wrong things. It gave the impression that market designers are all about stability and uh, uh, you know, deferred acceptance and we know nothing else, right? Uh, so I, I heard that criticism in many cases, okay? So bundling these two applications shifted the focus too much into technical aspects of these designs and away from political economy of a reform. Right. And focusing on the underlying policy economy, uh, I will just sh uh, show some of the differences in New York City and Boston. What happened in Boston is in 2002, the school assignment system completely went bankrupt. Okay, of nearly 100,000 students, approximately 30% has been assigned to a school that's not included their submitted list. The system was vulnerable to uh, strategic preference manipulation, similar to Boston. And apparently a number of schools were also able to conceal capacity. So in May, 2003, an uh, official consulted Alvin Roth whether the matching process at US medical match could be modified to design a new high school matching process. So they asked, can we use different acceptance to take care of the problems, right? And Rose said, yeah, you can do it, do it. Wonderful idea. So by the time design economists were involved in the redesign of New York City high school assignment process, the need for the reform was already established in a really bad, big way. And the authorities were in search of expert opinion. Maybe they were actually trying to cover themselves. Uh, like uh, they messed up big time, right? Uh, they need to show, you know, we are doing all we can. A leading expert in matching uh, market design was commissioned for a redesign of the system, but authorities were already le le leaning towards pseudo-optimal stable mechanism. Uh, so as it is the case in, other applications of commission market design, the persuasion stage of reform advocacy was completely bypassed under the New York City high school assignment reform. So applications of commission market design offer little guidance for outside the design economists on political economy of an aspired design, right? So the enhancement stage of the reform also had had start for New York City reform since authorities were already leaning towards uh, optimal stable mechanism. I mean, so if uh, policymakers didn't make that call to Alvin Roth, I would see this as more like external validity of the framework, really, rather than a reform in itself. Uh, okay. So, okay, I don't think we have time for kidney exchange. Uh, let me stop here and I will figure out whether I give up uh, one of the lectures or the second part, but uh, because I also have a very elaborate uh, conclusion, like several different kinds of conclusions, uh, but I don't want to be pushing my luck any further. I mean, people are hungry, they are annoyed, and uh, uh, so let me stop here. And uh, uh, thank you for your patience. I speak about lunch, so thank you. We'll thank you to lunch too. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. Let's, yeah, let's uh, talk more about lunch. Uh, so for uh, just announcement, so. Uh, uh, the, uh, we are going to have three more lectures, and the next one will be uh, on Wednesday at the same time, uh, although the week before me, maybe. Okay. Uh, yeah, I believe so. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, it is. Yeah. Very good. Uh, okay, so thank you very much.